Hello， Hey, hello. Yeah, I guess we have five minutes or so, don't we? Yeah. Hey, Victor. Nice to meet Yes, you. same here. And let me see if I can get this thing working. Let's see. Okay, there's me. Okay. Hey, <laughs> uh, would you like I... to introduce yourself? Yeah, so I run two companies. Uh, one of them is TKO Energy Capital, and the other one is Nano Energy Systems. So we work with capital money uh, on projects that uh, deal with the energy space. So we also do regulatory, uh, a lot in the U.S. Uh, for instance, we wrote the rules for energy storage in the ERCOC, Texas, and Wow. I'll show the rules. So. Uh, we made the foundation to make uh, the Texas the biggest renewable state in the country. And then also we work with PGM, up, that's up east, uh, which is 13 states, and, and also uh, MISO and SSP as well, which are the other grid operators. And we try to implement how to uh, reduce emissions, how do we uh, make it sustainable, like energy storage, Uh, where if we go too fast, we hurt the rate payer. In other words, people on fixed income. Uh, so as we penetrate with renewables, are we causing the cost of energy to go up, right? It's not balanced. So we work with that. Uh, we've worked with Tesla, we worked with ABB, we worked with GE, uh, all the regulatory bodies uh, with a focus of implementing technology and how to industrial scale, which reduce emissions, including the oil and gas people uh, who, who are very open. Uh, they just need guidance. Um, Mm for hmm instance, if somebody like uh, a big operator would be uh, Diamondback, that's a super major, like Exxon, like Chevron. Uh, they get the idea that if they have this much operating space, uh, that they own the substation. I said, well, how about put winter solar on your property, make additional revenue, you know, get their buy-in, get speak their language. And when I work with my solar people early on in the 90s, I said, guys, you got to understand how to speak utilities. You're speaking exotic language and scares them. And it's very hard to move the football forward. per se, if you don't understand their language and vice versa. So for instance, in Texas, to get the wind going at scale, we, we said to the guy, listen, uh, the rule is the lowest cost of energy gets on the grid first. Nothing fancy about it, but the fuel cost for wind is zero. So they get on the grid first. So much Yeah. so Mm -hmm. that... Uh, the wholesale price in Texas for ERCOC was $80 a megawatt on average. When wind started having high penetration above 10 gigawatt, the wholesale price was going down to $25 a gigawatt hour. And the super, the uh, uh, large 900-pound gorillas were complaining, which would be Duke Energy, Luminant, TXU, all those guys. And my answer was to these operators was buy wind. And they did. So... Next there, Duke Energy or large owners of wind farms, right? So as things change, uh, you have to be a Sherpa to guide these large industries of saying they will see the upside and way they can explain to their shareholders. So when we talk finance in this energy transition, we have to uh, be able to speak in a way that they can digest it and not able to put itself in a way that it's more than just a renewable thing, energy, uh, emissions, climate change, all these kind of items. There, there has to be sustainable conversation. Uh-huh. So, So yeah, that's what we do. I, yeah, I really see capital stack is crucial in this transition. And yeah, and, and that's what you do. And it that's awesome. So, um, later, uh, I'd like to have you introduce yourself again, because uh, we haven't started yet. Yeah, it's I don't know. very Well, nice you, to you have got you. a you got a prelude, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How about So you? I Now, what what do you do? Um, we are uh, 
startup advisor and uh, angel investors ourselves. And we are doing this newer initiative, the Global League, to collaborate across boundaries for angels and VCs and, and accelerators and uh, family offices to collaborate on deal evaluation and help help with uh, startups. So let me let people in. Yeah, it'll be very interesting. We have different people here. Hi, Zoha. Yeah, Our moderator today. So nice to see you all. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. I, I'm actually in Taiwan now, so it's midnight here. It's very nice to chat with you. Uh, let me do a quick opening. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. Where is she? Oh, here. Sure. Okay, um, so we are doing this uh, newer initiative, but we have been experimenting for a while, like uh, do deal review together and then do panels together. And uh, we'd like to have uh, a, a vetted network, but it's across boundary for credit or professional investors to collaborate on start evaluation and deal syndication and to identify the most impactful ventures and we select uh like deals from uh, specialized seed investors or uh or recommendations from advisor or call gp and all fellows can engage in evaluation so uh, we like to uh, focus on pre-a and a stage right now but uh, at least it's, it's my interest uh Maybe uh, others have different uh, focus, but that's why we love angels and we love C stage specialized funds. We also like to promote specialized funds uh, in deep tech, including hardware and software. And this event is focused on climate tech. And also for creative intelligence, essentially we like to gather uh, this uh, intelligence by synchronous, a format like a LinkedIn, email, newsletter, surveys, top-down trend studies, or synchronous interactions like today's meeting. And we compile them to share with this global link network. And we have been doing uh, panels for a while. Uh, and, uh, after this new year, happy new year to you all. I, uh, we want to try more interactive like uh, everyone, if you like to share, you can be a, a you can you can be a panel speaker, and uh, maybe I am the only one who know all the people in this network. Uh, in our newsletter subscribers, so far we have uh five hundred plus uh subscriber, and uh today we try um this in more interactive format. So you are welcome to introduce yourself. And in this network, uh, uh, there are startup advisors, uh, accelerators, angel investors, and uh, startup founders, VCs, and family uh, offices. And if you would like to introduce yourself later, uh, I will uh, let people to introduce yourself. You are very welcome. And um, just unmute yourself. Also, um, you can change rename. You, your your display by name and your organization, yeah. Um. So I think that's about all I want to say. And I want to introduce today's moderator first, uh, Zohab. Zohab is a EY consultant with long year experience in like hands on experience and also uh uh high level 
experience uh, with executives and uh, corporate executives uh, in the intersection of uh, built environment and energy transition. Hi, Zohab, would you like to say hello and introduce yourself? Hi, Jesse. Sorry, apologies. I have my connection just dropped. So I just uh, like I might have probably missed like the last minute. But uh, real quick about myself, uh, former mechanical engineer worked in the built environment for several years, uh, actually still a licensed uh, PE, um, worked in existing and commercial uh, nationally and globally. Um, and currently I uh, sit at EY as a business operations corporate strategy uh, working across several uh, ESG sectors and across uh, industries like as well. Uh, and the last, like I want to say like the last year and a half, I've been pretty involved within the startup e ecosystem uh, and leveraging obviously like my existing experience in energy in the built environment. So glad to be here uh, and happy to connect uh, afterwards. Thank you. And also, um... I'd like to also introduce Eric Berman. Uh, he's from EY Angels, e, uh, sorry, EA Angels, <laughs> UI consultant. And, and Eric is uh, with EA Angels. He has been investing in climate startups since 2006 with EA. EA is uh, very famous of uh, climate angel group. And he has served on the board as president, co-chair, and now as a secretary. Hi, Eric. Morning, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, did you want me to say any more in introduction of myself or? Uh... Oh, oh um, what, uh, whatever you like to say. Um, I can just quickly say, yeah, so E8, we are um, primarily Seattle-based, but we've been uh, growing our presence uh, uh, nationally and even internationally over the past uh, several years. Uh, Zoom certainly makes that easier. Uh, we are uh, an angel network, about uh, 130 accredited uh, investors, and we've uh, in collectively invested uh, about $63 million since 2006 in about 110, 120, 130 companies. Um, not exclusively climate tech per se, but but all uh, clean tech. So everything's got to have um, a a positive sustainable, sustainability angle to it uh, for us to even uh, consider them. But uh, once they're in, then they got to they got to. Uh, uh, warrant uh, on their on the merits uh warrant an investment thank you and uh who else like to introduce yourself the the floor is open like sean or yeah, one happy to go. hi hey everyone uh i'm i'm sean i met uh jesse here in austin through um one of the angel collectives i i, I work on here the stanford angels and entrepreneurs um, very, uh, I would say, uh, climate OG being in the space about 20 years initially as a scientist, but, um, over the course of that, I guess the last two decades kind of spanned business, uh, investing, uh, and founder startup, uh, investor operated type of roles. Uh, one of the main things I'm really interested in on here in Austin right now is, uh, kind of activating a, and unlocking the, the clean tech ecosystem here in Austin. Uh, I think there's a ton of potential here when you look at, you know, the university, academic institutions, incubators, ton of renewable developers, and, and obviously the whole uh, energy ecosystem overall. Um, but at the same time, I think there's there are a few bottlenecks uh, that uh, sort of a really sort of uh, a consolidated effort uh, of, of true believers can, can unlock. Um, I will... I'm sure we'll have more time to talk about that uh, over the over the course of the next couple panels. And uh, yeah, just always great to be connecting with um, with folks on this really cool and, and important topic. Yeah, one thing is wonderful is that uh, Austin actually has been ranked number one uh, nationwide of uh, for smart cities. So it's actually related to today's topic: build environment, urban tech, and uh, we also have Victor. Victor, uh, you are located in Austin, right? Yes. Uh, Sean and I met recently, Sean. 
uh, one of the Dr. Weber events, I believe. Uh, so we had a good conversation. So for us, uh, two companies, uh, Tico Energy Capital, uh, we focus energy centric items. Uh, we've been doing it for about 28 years uh, and able to deploy not in a million, but the B, the billion, we really had to dive in into the regulatory space, uh, such as various PUCs around the country uh, and also the ISOs like ERCOC. Uh, so with that being said, we, we helped format the rules for wind, the rules for solar, and the rules for energy storage uh, to get buy-in, not just with the regulatory phase, but also the stakeholders, which would be your Duke Energy, Luminant, TXU, things of that nature. Uh, with that being done, uh, we have about 58 gigawatt uh, installed with an, uh, an ERCOC system. There's 105 gigawatt of energy storage when I play ball. It won't all get done to give you an idea of the interest. And a little over 118 gigawatt of solar. So... That's just one state. We also work in PJM, uh, also Cal ISO, uh, MISO, and also uh, SSP, so all the grid operators and the various uh, utilities, which is about 122 utilities that we work with. Uh, we also do international work. We do stuff in China, we do stuff in Japan, uh, and also in Korea. So uh, their energy space. ERCOC is very interesting. It's, it's the most studied grid in the world. And so able to this kind of performance with this cost, uh, where for instance, our industrial contracts for, uh, let's say a semiconductor fab is about two and a half cents per KWH, right? Give you an idea. So how do you do that without being inundated with, with subsidies and things of this nature? Does it make business sense? And that's what we get really good at is putting the stakeholders, the money, the technology in alignment for sustainability. That's what we do. So uh, we probably did maybe, oh, I would say in the play about 18.5 billion within plays, uh, a lot of it's syndication, but it's a lot of learning lesson being at the ground floor of trying to get this initiation going and simplifying the language. So you have the finance, the utility, regulatory, all on the same page and you really simplify it in, in our book. Uh, if it becomes a hiccup that it's not working, we actually dive in technology. We work with ABB to do power electronics for energy storage because there wasn't energy storage that would uh, power electronics that would work for the various storage technologies, flow batteries, lithium, ultra capacitors, that kind of nature. Uh, we worked with oil and gas companies to bring down their electrical load. It's, it's massive in Texas and the gigawatts. Uh, and we did a program with ERCOC that if you shut down your field, that we can uh, reduce the low profile during extreme temperature events or winter events. Speaking of which, we wrote the leading analysis, and I think Sean and I talked about this a little bit, of what occurred in Winter Storm Uri. And by the way, folks, we're in for another cold spot this coming uh, Monday. So we'll see how that rolls out. Uh, and what do we learn and what do we need to do? And this is what happens when you have a state that is growing massively in load. Like in the last 20 years, we grew 25 gigawatt. That's the size of California on an average day, right? That's how big we grew. And utilities are not used to growing that extreme pace, which leaves us open for a winter storm Uri event. So it's a... Uh, it's not just uh, the ERCOC system, PGM is, is not accepting renewables for the next two years, the utility size uh, PPAs, power purchase agreements. So we're trying to guide them with that little deal. Uh, here in the US, we had the Inflation Reduction Act, which aggravated the problem because it helped renewables, wind and solar, but they didn't give us any money for wire. No wire, no permitting. So that's a little big challenge. And with the U.S. onshoring an enormous amount of manufacturing, we need half a terawatt of an additional capacity here in the U.S. within the next eight years where it's trending. Right now, we're about 1.1, 1.2 terawatt. Add another half a terawatt on top of that. 
And that's without the renewables doing any play whatsoever. So we're in a bit of a pickle, but then again, when there's a challenge, there's also an opportunity for solutions. So that's the kind of world that we play in. Thank you, thank you for sharing. So um, we also like to introduce yourself. Yeah, I like to note everybody. I've been shown before, but not the rest of you. Uh, hi, hi, Jesse. Hi, Paul. Oh, good ball. Oh, sorry. Okay. I, I, everybody, uh, Paul Bergen. I'm the general partner of Exit Ventures. We're a clean tech and sustainability impact fund. Uh, we focus on late C to Series B. And uh, I've been a former strategic acquirer, so we also focus on companies that are likely to be acquired by a strategic. And then we implement a proprietary exit plan for our portfolio companies that allows them to prepare in advance and uh, dramatically increase the odds of their exit as well as the value. Um, great to be on and listen to everybody else's uh, wisdom here today. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And, and Brian, are you? Uh... Yeah, sure. I'll jump in. I feel a little humbled after everybody going ahead of me here. So uh, my name is Brian Kearns. I live in Austin. Uh, I've been a tech executive here for a while now. I won't say how long. Um, I'm a active member of the Southwest Angel Network. I saw Juan was on also. Also, I'm a mentor in residence with uh, the Venture Well Aspire program, which uh, does its thing out of uh, Greentown Labs in Houston every summer for the clean tech space. Um, wow. I advise with several uh, several clean tech startups, and right now my area of fascination is trying to figure out um, a IoT and software solutions for a lot of these very early stage startups, because the, so we can get something that's faster to market, um, affordable, and that they can technically handle. I think it's a gap in the industry with a lot of these different companies all trying to spin up their own solutions. Thank you. I'm happy to go since uh, Hi, Juan. Uh, Brian mentioned my name. Um, so my name is Juan Thurman. As uh, Brian mentioned, I'm on the board of Swan Impact Angels here in Austin. Uh, I'm also a general partner at uh, Samia Climate Capital, uh, where we focus only on climate tech. We do uh, uh, seed stage investing in uh, central U.S. based uh, climate companies. Good to be here. Thank you. Um, hey Jesse, this is uh, hi, yeah, Mike. yeah. Hi, hi Jesse. Hey, hi. Um, Mike, Mike Purnell here. I'm uh, based in Chicago. I apologize, I'm not on video. We're in the middle of a power outage, Victor. Um, <laughs> you know that you. That you mentioned, um, you know, it's pretty cold here in Chicago. It's going to get colder, so we're experiencing um, <clears throat> a lot of what you were talking about with with ERCOT. But um, based here in Chicago, general partner um, EHI Clean Tech Ventures, we focus on clean energy and climate technology as well. Advising mm -hmm. a couple of um, you know climate tech startups, you know, at the moment, you know, what's interesting. For us, a couple of areas. One is, you know, obviously, you know, the storage side of it. You mentioned the IRA doesn't have a lot of funding for for the wires, um, you know, which, you know, uh, you know another, I guess, avenue uh, to alleviate some of that would be in the storage space. Um, so we definitely focus on uh, that. Not just the, you know, a lot of activity right now is around EV storage, batteries, if you will, but you know, the, the long-term utility storage as well, and even even going down into that supply chain. Um, so that's what we see, uh, a lot of activity happening for us. Um, you know, we, we're a U.S.-based firm, uh, focused primarily in the United States, I would say 90%, although we do have another, um, you know, another fun firm that we have in Mexico, Mexico City, and we focus you know, on all of the activity, clean energy and climate um, in, in Latin America as well. There's a lot of activity happening there. Quite frankly, um, there's a lot of activity happening from a nearshoring perspective. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're seeing a lot of um, activity raise. You know, the tide is rising at the moment right now in Mexico. And some of that is being driven by, 
the nearshoring activity that's happening um, just across the border in Monterrey, um, you know, with a lot of EV manufacturing going on down there. So we're seeing a lot of activity um, in that particular fund uh, that we that we also manage as well, um, you know, on the on the Latin American side. So um, great to meet you guys and uh, look forward to, um, you know, being engaged here um, with the team. Wow. Thank you. Interesting. I just want to introduce Hi. myself. Hi, uh, David. David Balkum, how are you? I'm a financial advisor in New York City with Wealthbridge Financial Group and uh, full service high net worth advisory. And I'm focused on cl helping clients decarbonize their portfolios and otherwise profit from environmental <coughs> responsibility. So that's what brings me here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Kim, would you like to introduce yourself? You are muted. You don't show um, as muted, but uh, no, no audio is coming through. Well, you can type really fast on the chat. <laughs> Read your lips. Maybe while Kim is figuring out, uh, I can uh, continue with a little bit about uh, the rules uh, i like to have here. Uh, the, the goal of this kind of uh, event is for exchanges and networking. So, uh, Maybe a, a good outcome is uh, collaborate on deal reviews and helping startups. So uh, investors can recommend startups to ask for collaboration. Um, but this is not for startups to pitch and welcome investors to recommend startups. And also uh, on the other hand is about trend discovery. Investor and startups can share the industry insights. So the best way for startups to be recognized is to share industry insights. Uh, but we 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 we, have, we don't have a lot of startups yet in this uh, global league network uh, because um, I like to keep it more about uh, investors so far. Okay, so I I think Tim is trying to uh, re-enter. So. Um, Is there anyone uh, like to make an introduction? Or uh, we can get into. Yeah, see, I'll just introduce out. myself. Oh, hi. Hi, John. Hey. I, I, my name is John Costa, uh, founder of a uh, company at online publishing and educational firm called Republit. Um, I've been working with Jesse for a decade or so now. <laughs> um, in the data analytics space uh, yeah. around learning and, and training. Uh, we've worked with, um, we did a smart cities uh, project and actually won a, an Austin smart cities event uh, wow. a number of years back with George Mason University uh, and used the platform, you know, as a distribution mechanism for uh, smart city education and knowledge distro. So that's that's my focus is to uh, inform sustainable projects and sustainability um, by educating people that are venturing into this space um, and helping them distribute information and knowledge. So um, that's what uh, Republic does. I'm not quite a uh, financial investor yet. I'm a time and technology investor, but um, I'm working on the financial piece of it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, old friend. So um, I see we have a new one coming in. Um, um, Ape or Ar oh, Ar If you want, Jesse, um, while we're waiting, waiting for folks, Mm -hmm. just thought, maybe, thought, thought or observation. 
I think uh, I love I love the push both around the investment themes and for deal sharing uh, and obviously sort of the diligence around that. Uh, I think for anyone that's been on either side of the the angel investing you know process as as a founder, um, you know obviously there's some things that are great about it. It's things that are just like inherently difficult about bringing together um, you know a number of folks for for small checks. I think one one observation that I've I've noticed in particular in the last year is that. Um, Climate tech investing or, or angel climate tech investing, I think, is particularly difficult um, in in this kind of format, just because climate tech inherently, I think, has just a substantially higher uh, complexity on on multiple dimensions. Um, thinking sort of specifically around uh, technology, obviously, uh, regulatory complexity, uh, and then um, also like like market slash economics. So I think. You know, one of the things that, um, and, and this is, I'm sure, an area of like close collaboration. But one of the things that I think we were trying to do in Climate Hub, uh, uh, or sort of a pain point that we've observed is, you know, as you as you drive, you know, as as angel angel as any sort of angel collective is looking at a um, either a sort of investment thesis or in particular a, a, a startup, I think having almost like dedicated diligence tracks around um, each of those those verticals um, in 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 the angel process. I think is an area where angel collectives can can really bring bring value, right? So rather than what I've seen in some cases, um, you know, where it's kind of just a bunch of angel investors sort of peppering the founder with uh, whatever they think their relevant uh, diligence questions are, actually having a dedicated lead, um, for instance, on the technology track, right? And, and really having someone that is able to sort of fully frame that analysis, like run it through to the ground for a week or two weeks or, or whatever that might be. Similarly on things like uh, market and technology, right? Uh, you know, I think every single deck that probably you'll we're going to see going forward is going to have a price of carbon uh, in that in, in that in that deck probably. But actually, I think going through the analysis around you know is this voluntary versus a uh, required you know carbon like why is this price there, et cetera, et cetera. Right? That even something as as minor as that, which is you know, potentially only one revenue stream, um, can require some some dedicated diligence. So. Just while I'm kind of buying some time, um, and and we have a minute here, I think that just that one thought and observation around like how can you like what's unique and different about um sort of climate tech and to your point as you develop as you think about having a specialized um sort of angel angel collective ways that that can be oriented around that around that process to um provide a more sort of like structured and um value add on both sides of the of the both for founders and for and for the and the angels to to dive into those in those verticals. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Mm -hmm. um, Hi, uh, can you hear me now? Or no? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Finally, thank you, thank you for the mic and uh, Jesse. As always, I really appreciate your efforts in um, you know gathering people around the world. Seems like. You know, there's a lot of uh, Texans on this call, which is super cool. I've never been, but uh, I'm originally born and raised from Alberta, which is uh, Canada's, I guess, uh, version, let's say, of Texas. Um, so, yeah, my, my background is in electrical engineering. Uh, I have uh, over 15 years of experience in uh, municipal infrastructure and uh, project management. Uh, so last year, I... Um, uh, started a fund uh, called Attack on Technologies, and essentially our focus is on Internet of Things, uh, as well as the business productivity software, which may or may not be AI driven. Um, and yeah, just uh, happy to join this call to meet these, uh, meet uh, all you fine folks. Uh, some a, a few things that uh, uh, was of interest to me that was mentioned by some of the previous speakers is things like smart cities. Uh, my background is in control and automation. Uh, so uh, although our uh, investment portfolio isn't, um, I guess, focused on clean tech per se uh, um, directly, uh, I would say, you know, there are some um, adjacent sort of interests uh, because as um, I think our population grows uh, here in Canada, so I'm here in the uh, Vancouver, Canada, which is just a couple of hours drive north of Seattle. So as the population grows in Vancouver, uh, in a lot of the major metropolises within America, I think it's uh, incumbent upon uh, society to uh, be able to um, develop new and novel ways to uh, for energy management in a way that's uh, economical. 
Uh, so my interests include uh, grid, uh, smart grid uh, modernization, which is very much so in line with uh, just uh, my professional background. Uh, I am a licensed uh, professional engineer or PE here in uh, Canada. And yeah, I'm just uh, really uh, glad to have uh, to be able to meet everyone here. And I really appreciate this sort of like more open format. And oh, just one more thing really quickly, Jesse, uh, to the previous speaker's point, I, I think that it is good and important to have that sort of structure uh, to kind of do uh, due diligence instead of uh, having kind of like a panel of uh, interested investors, uh, um, as he said, you know, kind of like pepper the, uh, the, uh, the startup co-founder with uh, questions. Uh, so to that end, I'm actually involved, for instance, with the Kretsu group here in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, in fact, uh, one of the things we did last year was um, uh, complete a 90 page due diligence report for a local startup uh, called Iris Dynamics. It's a, um, it's a four phase linear motor actuator uh, startup. Um, so uh, that was interesting. And I think uh, just the way that it's structured and uh, just the team, the multidisciplinary team uh, is uh, been quite good. And yeah, I see that uh, to Eric's point, yeah, most uh, uh, credits do reports are quite uh, lengthy. But anyways, uh, thank you everyone for uh, the introductions and looking forward to connecting with uh, with everyone. So thank you. Yeah. Um, actually, DD is a very heavy process. So uh, we, we collaborate. That's the, the purpose of this event, this group. Um, yeah. Jesse. And sorry, just Hi. to jump in really quickly, I guess, yeah, you know, hopefully we can kind of help each other, obviously, and kind of streamline that. And, you know, mm -hmm. here uh, at Tachyon, we're trying to really uh, automate a lot of this, possible. you know, using technologies like um, uh, AI to uh, scrape uh, company information, publicly available com company information, of course, uh, and uh, just to streamline things on the back end as well. Uh, so then uh, a lot of this reporting and the heavy lifting in terms of, um, very specific information can uh, be, you know, um, uh, collated and analyzed in a very concise way. So yeah, happy to uh, potentially work with uh, my folks. So um, Paul, um, are you trying to say something? Yeah, yeah, I did just to follow up on Sean and Tim's point, um, completely agree with, with Sean's, you know, points on due diligence and, um, and Tim's as well. Uh, you know, I'm the Clean Tech Committee co-chair for Koretsu uh, mm. Northwest. And that's how I know Jesse. Jesse's also uh, a participant and a member, and that's that's where we met. Um, mm. Completely agree with you, Sean, that, you know, you've got to have uh, team leads, and that's what we, we do. And you're all invited not to take away anything from what Jesse's doing here, because I love what she's doing, and that's why I'm here. But um, you're all invited and can all join as guests to the Kretsu Northwest Clean Tech uh, Committee if you wanna, um, you know, just ping me at, at paul at exitventures.net. Happy to set you up there too. Uh, we'd love to have, you know, people come and bring new life and talents into the committee. It's about 50 people. And in that process, we, we set up a due diligence team uh, it's half a dozen to 10 people with the relevant skills and experience. And that's a, about a month process where we tackle the different functional areas of due diligence as a team and then publish this, as you've heard, lengthy <laughs> due diligence report. But my opinion is, is that, you know, good due diligence prevents uh, dumb mistakes in the future or just, um, <clears throat> you know, reduces mm -hmm. risk. And so uh, anyway, if anybody wants to, to join us there, uh, feel free to ping me, but just wanted to validate and, and say I agree with both Sean and Tim that, you know, we're all on the same page. And I'd love to, if anybody has the best practices, I'm very willing to open, you know, to, to learn here. That's why we're all here. And, and if we want to replicate some or all of that here with this group, you know, would be really uh, interested in, in working with this group too, to kind of tackle that kind of, uh, you know, new idea generation and due diligence. 
Yeah, I must say a uh, Karasu forum has a very large network and also the DD process is very thorough uh, with uh, very uh, the the angles that is needed need for the due diligence. Uh, but for climate tech, to my knowledge, I, I will see E8 has the uh, most thorough uh, climate tech network. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, uh, with Erica, would you like to share about how you do the DD? Um, I'm sorry, how we do our, our diligence process? Uh-huh, yeah. So, because um, a lot of deals are very early, right? Yeah, and then, yeah, we're absolutely <clears throat> seeing the generally precede uh, uh, companies. Um, you know, the, the, we're far, far too much convertible debt or actually uh, safe notes, which I I absolutely despise, but I <laughs> that's my own personal opinion on that. Um, yeah, and so we have a, we, we try and do as much sort of pre-diligence as possible um, in our screening process. So we get, you know, 40, 30, 40 applications a month. And, you know, the, the, uh, of those, probably 20 of them are really easy to, to just, blow off as irrelevant or out of our area or or <clears throat> the other uh, an idea on an applicant um, but we we do um have a, a pretty thorough vetting process on our screening uh where we uh evaluate the companies to decide who has the best uh, uh chance of success uh, once the companies come and and pitch to us we actually are our goal is our, our DD philosophy is actually a little bit different from Koretsu. Koretsu's um, uh, DD philosophy is is to have a very thorough, sort of very methodical and comprehensive um, uh, uh, report. Um, ours is to try to, ironically, you know, we're investors. Our our goal is to get to know as quickly as possible. Um, if we're not going to invest. We want to figure that out as quickly as possible and stop. Um, and so we're trying to find the key uh, red flags. And so, you know, in, investment in some ways is the result of a failure to find those red flags. And so what we try to do in our DD reports is um, really make them sort of an executive summary that say, okay, you know, you know in these eight, Eight, nine areas, you know, go to market plan, IP, um, uh, team, things like that. Identify these are the issues that we think uh, uh, an investor really needs to consider. Here are some of the things that um, that you you might uh, fi find yourself getting comfortable with, but here are some of the things that, that uh, you might not be comfortable. So we're not making it. We're not advising people about uh, about whether or not to invest, but so so much as. Um, uh, uh, trying to make sure that people are considering the the the, the areas of concern that that we that we uh, can dig up. Um, so our our DD teams tend to be you know three to five people. We try to do it within uh, just a few weeks, um, and we die and we'll break it down into these uh, segments and try and make something that's that's easily digestible where you can see okay here are the risks I'm taking. Uh, am I comfortable with those risks if I'm excited about the prospects for the company? So that. That's, that's, uh, very, that's, that's so true, because uh, we get three to 15 items a day. Uh, I have a wonderful staff, uh, and I'm too old to go through that much material. However, I've been doing this for a couple decades. What raises to the top? And it would be interesting to hear uh, everybody else, what their experience is when it comes to due diligence. I'm glad Sean brought it up. So what we see is there might be a great product or service that we're interested in, but the football team is not that good. We know what the end game is going to be. And so the two large investment uh, arenas I play in, one's in Miami once a year, another one is in San Diego. So they're all major infrastructure, multifamily offices, and we look at everything. And it's a 90% no because of the football team. So if it's interest is uh, – Yes, we're interested, but we got to change the football team. And that's where the rub comes. Uh, usually you might have a founder who might be 
put themselves in a CEO position and they're not. So that's usually, I'm sure, I'm sure all of you guys ran into the same thing. Uh, where do we get to where it's making revenue, sustainability, you know, clean tech, clean tech's got to hold itself, right? And we've done it, right? Of all the wind and solar and energy stores that we've done, I can't imagine of how much CO2 that, that's been removed. Uh, and that's just in Texas. I can't imagine if we went from 60 gigawatt to 92 gigawatt plus spinning reserve. And that's just, just gas and coal right so that's one way to look at it from from that perspective but from a finance economic sustainable sustainability kind of item when it comes to i got a new power electronic i got something that that would make things better um we got something that can look at energy profile and know that behind the meter that this entity is not revenue efficient which means they're they're generating a lot of excess co2 and we calculate all the time because we have a lot of AI tools as well. I should be more interested in that, but my my uh, my CTO loves that stuff. So with that being said, I like to hear what everybody says. Is like, what's been your experience in due diligence? What's been in that category? The football team is just not capable because it sounds like what I'm hearing from everybody on the panel that that might be an element as well that we can assist you in that element, right? The right, and we've done that before. So you know what, here's something that's similar. Let's see if we can do a, uh, a merger to make you guys successful is an element. And does that fit the profile of this panel? Because I've heard early stage is the element and it is, but we always find, if I find something early stage that we're interested in, I always find a big brother as a partner client to take it to the next level quickly. In other words, I'm going to start selling thousands of units if this really works, either from software perspective or product. But yeah, I'd like to hear from everybody else what their experience is. I mean, I have one thought on this. I don't know if it's it's experience, but um, for, for for truly early stage, it sounds like you guys might be a little bit later later in in the stage, more on sort of closer to growth. But like one thing that we're playing around with is working, collaborating with things like the Founder Institute or other members of the ecosystem here to actually provide that earlier stage incubation and acceleration support. So as you said, you, know, you might have a founder that's got a great technical idea or is just really charismatic on business development and things like that, but doesn't have the rest of the toolkit. Um, can you at least um, sort of provide the the scaffolding from that sort of pre-seed to maybe early stage investment um, to to bridge that that gap? Um, that might not sort of that might not sort of solve the inherent problem you're talking about. Then maybe there's still time to sort of uh, you know change the seats or switch up the team. Uh, but that's certainly I think that, that I, I would just add in there the idea of um, the accelerator slash like incubator um, support and at least here in Austin I think you know th those those resources do exist. Um, my, my quick reaction there. I'm I'm interested. Yeah, this is a great conversation because we just saw a company that's got some great technology from a university professor, um, kind of a spin out of a university tech uh, in the water uh, water treatment space. But the 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 management team, they're all kids out of college, right out of that university, uh, 23 years old, three years old, oh, guys, 23 years old. Um, I, I don't, I pass because I, you know, they, they don't know what they don't know, right? There's no management experience. Um, if I, I would have been very excited if they would have said, look, we're committing to within the next year with the money that they're raising now to bring on a CEO that's experienced in the industry, right? Then that would, that would change everything. But, um, I'm interested, Sean and others, you know, it, does in this case, does an, does an incubator an accelerator move the needle for you know for a team that's in their first job out of school um i don't know i'm, I'm not challenging you i'm just I'm, I'm kind of asking the question no it's a great question if i could just respond really quick um i think it's a it's a great point and and uh you're i've very i've had very very similar experiences including like personally um around folks that like you know they don't know what they don't know and that and and to your, and totally agree that i think uh an accelerator slash like incubator is not necessarily going to solve that problem um one of the design considerations that i think i'm really trying to um engineer into this uh the the climate up process here is um to that to that point around you know you mentioned essentially as part of those milestones in the raise in the raise one of those uh, uh to do's 
is uh, is hiring a, a COO. I think there's an, also an element also, here yeah. around really engaging the actual institutional oh, investors, oh, yeah. whether those be VCs or, or or otherwise, that would be coming into the next round. So not only are you sort of are you raising that that pre seed or that seed capital with these folks, um, and then sort of making sure that there's that accelerator and incubator bridge, but like quite literally that when you're raising the, the sources and uses at that pre seed slash seed round are basically agreed and aligned on with the you know prospective folks coming in at the next round, and before you even sort of close that close that deal, the the business plan, the milestones, you know what's going to get hiring, et cetera, et cetera. Is uh, is actually really linked to and bridging between the seed yeah, and you know, and sort of prospective future investors. Obviously, that requires an engagement from the folks that would be coming in the next round. And you know, the idea is here in Austin, we have enough of a sort of a coalition of the willing that they might be willing to in- engage and sort of in a non um, binding way say yes, I would, I would, I would support this the startup if they hit these milestones with the funding they're raising now. Um, but one one quick reaction to that, and, and and also agreeing that yes, if you have a management team that has no idea what they're doing and don't know just like how big the gaps are that not, that is not necessarily going to, going to close that. Yep. Yep. No, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, like I say the, the topic development. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would say incubator, like the Houston incubator and incubators we have in Austin, uh, incubators in California, uh, offering a place for uh, some sort of uh, startup happening outside the university or co with the university, we find out that it uh, uh, lags the pain factors. It's, it's, it's bleeding out uh, before they're able to get execution. So in other words, who's holding your feet to the fire, right? Because you have three years to make this happen. So 99% of startups with technology, great technology goes south if you can't hit the three-year mark, Right. Some of us, depending on what they're doing, it's a shorter time frame, but you, you got to be able to lift off at three year. So that's not an absolute, but that's a common item for success, uh, both on the uh, aptitude of the team just gets wore out uh, trying to get that uh, and the reasons why. But that's where it comes through with the panel that I'm looking at is, is hey, guys, uh, let's talk about your sell cycle, right? which I agree with Eric. That's a huge misnomer because like you said, it takes a lot of experience to be able to commercialize your service and product. So, but after that three-year mark, you become unattractive to investors and off-takers like myself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for all the wonderful sharing. Um, I'd like to pull back uh, to our topic. Uh, so for the build environment, and energy transition. Uh, we don't have much time left, but uh, for conversation-wise, uh, on a high level or on good deals that do you see, uh, what would you like to share? Either on trends or on good deals. So we did, we've done, in my little career, about <laughs> 4 billion square foot of commercial industrial space, the real estate space. And on the green building side, it's interesting because we were doing buildings when when we did the building, you can get single pane glass. If we got e-glass, double pane glass, the underwriter would not uh, comp the debt, right? So we said this is value in the future. And, and we said, well, we'll pay the Delta difference on it. Now, when I do my buildings and I say, hey, underwriter, we're putting single pane glass, they say no, right? So that's where the money is. It says, you know, who are decision makers at scale? And it's the people who underwrite the debt when we talk about commercial buildings. So wherever it might be, energy efficiency, LED, micro turbines, energy storage, on and on and on. Now, to not to freak out the underwriter, we call it on the category of energy efficiencies because that's what they understand. So especially when a building get, re- get refied, the biggest holder of commercial real estate is Wells Fargo. And they, re- they refi about 400 closings a day. So it's a huge market. And that's when we capture them. That's when we capture them. Hey, you know what? I know you guys are doing new glass and new carpet, but let's talk about energy efficiency. Let's talk about 
uh, energy storage, let's talk about turning this building into a gross lease, things of this nature to add value. When we add value, we reduce the carbon footprint of the building and the building value is able to hold its debt. So those are the kind of things that we get into that you, you want to go small to large in an initiative. But lo love to hear everybody else's thoughts on that. So I'll just uh, observe that some of our biggest investments have actually been in the built environment um, space. And uh, my biggest observation is that particularly now uh, compared to say 10 or 15 years ago, um, it is not a technology play. It is a deployment and financing and customer acquisition play. Um, and uh, in many ways, it is not even a quote unquote uh, angel investor play in the sense of you're making a high risk equity investment in a company that has a hockey stick uh, uh, growth potential ahead of it and a high risk of failure, um, but rather something where uh, you can actually you, you need a lot of deployment capital. And this was actually one of the big things that that really uh, surprised us. About 10 years ago, we had invested in a company that was doing uh, real estate where they would buy um, uh, distressed uh, real estate. Once upon a time, there was just such a thing. Um, and do deep energy retrofits, uh, energy efficiency retrofits and flip it. Uh, and so we had invested um, about, I don't know, a million dollars or so into the company via equity. And they came to us um, asking for a, a debt fund to help finance uh, just all the liquidity you need to actually do that on an operational basis. And we hemmed and hawed because, oh, you know, we're angel investors. We do, we do equity we, in series A and series C and stuff like that. We don't do debt. And they, they ended up raising over $10 million from us. Um, and, you know, because it was out of a different um, investing wallet. Uh, but also it it really was that they could use off the shelf stuff. They could they could um, collateralize it. They could there was no technology risk. It was all financial and execution risk. And they could these are things that they could address. And so we we found ourselves thinking a little less about are we angel investors who focus on clean tech and as opposed to are we clean tech investors who focus who, who have a specialty in quote unquote angel investing. Um, and so I think actually uh, some of the more interesting deals I'm seeing now are actually more block and tackle execution deployment plays as opposed to, hey, I've got some new whiz bang uh, 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 technology, you know, that that will eke out, you know, another half a percentage of, of efficiency out of a solar panel or battery or whatever. Eric, that's very interesting. Uh, because, you know, we always look at larger scale, but we look at the angel side, like Jesse's talking about. So, hey, you know, a lot of us have angel experience and things of this nature. Let's look at something that's emerging technology. <laughs> but when we look at where is that little pinch that pushes over the elephant, right? I need a mouse to push over the elephant, right? So because I add this little item that came from angel tech, angel clean tech, right? It's able to push up the elephant. That's where I think this this uh, the mass intelligence that this panel has can see when we vet. To Sean's point, right? DD. Hey, you know what? We like that, but how does that item we're interested in at the angel level can push down the elephant? Right. That's what we look for all the time because you know we're on the clean side, but we're also in oil and gas. And because we're on oil and gas, we reduce emissions more than all the wind and solar we have in Texas, right? We understand their methane. We understand how to do their pipe. We added technology. And because of that, we're able to refi that oil and gas company to bring in new money to clean it up, right? Which adds more value on the second play, right? So it's more than just buying the field, pump, drill away, and sell it. No. We buy it, clean it, add tech, right? Then your OPEX drops like a rock. But so does your methane. So does, so does your CO2. So that makes all the 
private equity guys who play in this space very, very happy, right? And we're hitting the ultimate goal because we know that the drilling's not going away. Petroleum is there and everything we touch, all the clothes we're wearing right now is from petroleum, right? All of us as an, as an item. I know that 25% of natural gas generates 50% of the world's food. That's not going away, right? And we're very concerned, at least my board members and I, is what we do to move forward on energy transition and technology centric that we don't harm the working poor or the middle class, regardless of the country, right? Because all of us can double our energy costs and we wouldn't care less. That's not so much for a teacher who's getting paid and gonna live paycheck to paycheck barely, right? So we have to be really careful. And I said that to a bunch of PUCs when they're initiating a project is don't just don't do so much penetration on renewables that your rates go up and you hurt the working poor. I love renewables. I apply materials, I did thin film solar, myself and three other guys, we invented that damn thing, right? Not to the point we start harming the people we're trying to protect. Right. And we have that as part of our uh, initiation when we look at something, because, you know, we do have the financial horsepower that really, really do a ton of green, but it can do a lot of harm. Anyway, one, I said thing, too much. <laughs> one, one technology that I'm interested in, if anyone's got any opinions, is uh, 3D building printing, um, which I came across just in the last uh, month or so, you know, the the drivers are huge, right? I mean, less the, the waste, the time, labor savings, concrete savings, um, all, you know, the, the, just the CO2 footprint. I mean, all of the, the key drivers here are, are very interesting. I think it's very, it's very NASA and technology. I haven't really seen it um, uh, be deployed in any significant scale. Although uh, apparently some of the strategics that I've talked to are, are very interested in this kind of emerging tech. I'm curious if anybody has any experience or thoughts. There's a company in Austin, Sean, you might have heard of them, um, and they do the 3D pinning, the combination of um, um, they type a building material and then they 3D print the walls and what have you, and they can build um, 1,500 square foot within 24 hours. Yeah. Not 48 hours. Yeah. Yeah, I have. And actually, I was, I was going to write a note, but um, to this point around not letting the energy transition leave some of the most vulnerable communities behind, um, I'm, I, I'm not sure, I think you probably mean in, in, in we might be talking about sort of uh, in, in developed markets, uh, but I think there's also, on, on, on the optimistic note, uh, I'm from South Africa originally, done a lot of work on the continent, and I think, you know, you see there some examples of where, you um, renewables and distributed energy technologies are actually disinherently advantaged. So to give a quick example, you know, Africa has unbelievably low um, energy density per capita. Um, it's almost impossible to do a new build utility on anything. Um, so like solar, like, so off, so distributed off grid solar and storage is like a amazing, amazing boon. Um, you could make it's probably a little bit outside of the scope or, or range of the, you know, this, this, this investor group, but um, on the optimistic side, there's a lot of money and a lot of great businesses being built right now in, in Africa around purely sort of, you know, giving, you know, communities that are off grid access to micro solar and, and, and storage. And I'm sure there probably, you know, hopefully there are other examples like that where, you know, um, Victor and, and folks, there's less of that trade-off between making the energy transition and taking care of, to your point, Victor, most vulnerable, um, individuals and communities. Sean, and you're right. I'm referring to people who already have power versus yeah. people who need power. Uh, a light bulb is a huge amount of increasing a community, a nation's education level, hugely, right? That's easy, yeah. right? Affordable. Uh, people like the investment, we talked about the, uh, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, that can be harmful. Um, so, if we have power and they're used to a certain rate of the cost of energy um, and we are blasting away with an enormous amount of money, uh, what are we doing? Uh, take a step back uh, versus people who have no grid, no power or reliable power. What can you do there? I mean, that's, that's a little over 5 billion people that really don't have steady power in the world. So 
Yes, a good point, Sean. Yeah, this was a great conversation, just to echo what uh, Juan said. Uh, I think, you know, to allude a little bit to what Victor just said, you know, a lot of people in the world uh, don't have access to reliable power. Uh, and then even here in, um, you know, North America, there's a lot of, you know, flyover states or like flyover provinces, if you will, uh, where they also don't have access to, you know, um, either reliable power or just um, able to kind of grow and scale up as these towns grow. Because here in Canada, there's a lot of resources that, you uh, uh, can be extracted and it is currently being extracted. For instance, in the province of uh, Saskatchewan, there's a lot of uh, fertilizer, potash, that's used, uh, that's, uh, you know, um, uh, mined and, and processed and shipped uh, around the world. And, you know, America being our biggest trading partner, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's so many opportunities. But anyways, I uh, don't want to take up too much of everyone's precious time. Uh, really appreciate meeting everyone here and thank you, Jesse, for uh, facilitating this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, nice to have this sharing and I can stay a few more minutes if you want to talk to me. And thank you for joining the conversation today. Well, my uh, uh, I have a I'm here with Sean at Central Texas. So 11 o'clock, I got 11 o'clock Zoom meeting such as we're having now. So I have to go. Uh, but great conversation, great panel, uh, lots of experience. So look forward to our next conversation and and in a way that we can be fruitful with our time. Um that will lead to making a, a difference that uh, I hope turns into a domino effect. I love when that happens. Yeah, I so saw different people have different angles and strengths. Uh, so for deal evaluation, I would love to uh, be able to coordinate these talents together for collaboration. Thank you. Actually, Jesse and uh, Victor, like real Hi. quick, like that point, uh, you know, like I, was like a little preoccupied and I wanted to chime in like a little earlier, but I wanted to see if we could leverage sort of the collective um, and in part due to helping sort of like along like with the DD process here, right? And obviously like that's a big point and it, like the variations and the nuances that like we encounter. Um, like I believe as a collective, like we'd be able to sort of leverage some of this uh, and be able to engage with some of the more new climate uh, market intelligence platforms. Um, mm -hmm. Currently, like the uh, CTVCs and the net zero insights and the climate data, their 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 typical client customers uh, like have been the corporate VCs and 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 investors. But mm -hmm. I'd like to see if like I'd be able to sort of garner some of the group, and maybe Jesse, if you could share with me, uh, like maybe like everyone's email, like I can kind of send something out. Um, and I'd like to, you know, uh, prepare like a proposal possibly like for uh, for some of these climate tech uh, insights mm -hmm. and see if we can kind of leverage and get garner maybe like a little niche like of our own uh, and be able to use that for our DD, you know, purposes. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, also so market maybe, insights. Yeah, they would be awesome. Correct. Um, correct. Yeah. yeah so actually you can uh, send me your thought idea and I will share it out with newsletter. So it will be shared with 500 people. Okay, okay, yeah. All right, great. Well, thank you, that. that's a great idea, I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, that's great, right. that's great. Thank you, Zohar. Have a great weekend. Yeah, Likewise. you will have Take a care. great weekend. Thanks everyone, have a great weekend. Take care. Thank, Take thanks, care. John, David, thanks.